Good evening and welcome to the show. This is the First Amendment, historically speaking, and my name is Frederick Douglass Dixon and I will be your host. Thank you for tuning in. As always, I have to thank UPTV for allowing us this small time that we have to come before you and hopefully forward some thoughts that will be considered esoteric by the masses of folks, but if we continue to forward an alternative thought, then we have done our job. Again, I'd like to thank the entire staff. I always have to thank Daniel. He's a very, I really appreciate all his help, and he's a very forthright young man, so I thank him so very much. Today, you all, I would like to begin by looking at our atmosphere, the social atmosphere, the social culture here in America, as we look to some of the things that have happened recently over just the last couple of months. And, and then we wonder, and then we look to what the future will be like here in America. And more specifically, I like to speak to those who are looking and viewing who understand that this American system as we know now is well on the decline when we look at economics and what the dollar means in the economic world, when we look to the morality or lack thereof in America, and then we look to America being perhaps one of the most violent places on the planet, it all reveals to us that America is indeed in crisis. America is indeed in trouble, and America is indeed on its divine path towards its own destruction. I want to be very clear when I look to one specific crowd of Americans and a very wise man said that blacks here in America were a nation inside of a nation. There were people amongst people who were a people who were disenfranchised, who were left at the periphery of society. That was the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and his wisdom reeks again and I want to make sure that I start with a quote from this very wise man, and he says, our future is at stake, and 99% of us do not know it. So America, as they have put to sleep the black man, woman, and child, what role do we play in our own demise? What role do we play in our own inability to do for oneself while waiting for someone to do what we should be able to do for ourselves? This is, in very, this is a very serious topic, and I want to make sure that because we have this avenue, I want to speak to you and speak as candidly as possible, but we have to be very honest. So, number one, honesty. There's not one of us that's bigger than honesty. Not one bigger than the truth. So we will deal with the truth today. And the idea is not to have it be harmful towards anyone or not to have one feel uncomfortable about the truth. But if it indeed makes you feel uncomfortable, the truth in itself, then you're very comfortable with half-truths, wicked lies, and falsehoods. And we want to erase that during this small time that we have. So we have to be very clear. Being in America, or more specifically being black in America, what has America given to that particular paradigm or that particular thought. And Frederick Douglass talks about it in his, in, his very, in his wisdom. He says, when we talk about manhood and we talk about being men and being productive American citizens for the black community, he says, it is vain that we talk of being men without doing the work of men. You have to look to those things that have given you your examples or those who have taught you mentors or parents or maybe not biological parents or those who have played that role. So when we look to the black man, woman, and child, we can look to those who forwarded or taught the instruction of what it means to be black in America. And there's a very wise man who said those who prescribe the, the, prescribe the parameters will proscribe the outcomes. So America has been, and we mean the elites of America, those who have profited greatly, have been the parents, or more specifically, the step-parents 
of blacks in America. So our thought patterns are driven by what we've internalized and the learned behaviors that we've had here in the wilderness of North America on these shores. So if we understand that we have been robbed of our original parents and now we have a step parent and that step parent is indeed in charge of what goes on in America, sets the pace socially, economically, politically, and what we know to be now, what is happening in America across these cities on a daily basis. What we see is the erase, the idea to erase, the idea to get rid of, the idea of violently removing the black man, woman, and child from the American tapestry. So if we understand that this is indeed a very pivotal and crucial time in America. More specifically, what have we seen over the last three or four years? We have seen black men, women, and children being killed wholesale by those who are in positions of authority, and then backed up by those who are in position of authority that you have voted into office through their procedures, through their legalities, and through their regulations. How do we look to America other than that wicked particular group of people who are the bullies all across the country, all across the world, and globally look to outside of America as the ultimate mischief maker? And the Honorable Professor Willie Dixon Jr., 83 years young and still teaching, he said in his 1995 penultimate work, there are three levels at which the oppressor may deal with the oppressed. Liberation, pacification, and liquidation. That's a very strong term to have said in 1995 as he charged the United States government with genocide of the black community, which indeed, if we look back, and we look with a very crucial term, then yes, we do know that America has indeed proscribed genocide as the final solution to the Negro problem. Now the Negro problem reads, what should be done with the presence of the troublesome Negro for maximum exploitation? I wanna reiterate that. What should be done with the presence of the troublesome Negro for maximum exploitation. Now these particular terms were developed, researched, discussed, and agreed upon as early as 1890 at the Mohawk Conference. In 1892 at the Mohawk Conference number two, Rutherford B. Hayes was, the ex-president Rutherford B. Hayes was indeed the keynote speaker. We have to be very clear. More specifically, we have to, as adults, get over the idea of what it is that our children, our students can't handle. And we have to provide them with truth. I have to be very cognizant of our position, how we got here, more specifically, what are some of the solutions. So we look to quick solutions. Where there are great illnesses, there must be great remedies. And we are indeed under a great situation of illusion, of inclusion, that indeed gives us a connection to our illness. We want rain without thunder and lightning. We want the task to be light, the burden to be easy. If that were the case, then the dumb would speak very eloquently and the lame would leap like a rabbit. This is indeed a very tricky situation that we have come to over these years. And out of our most creative genius is produced by our collective pain. So now, what role have we played as black Americans that fall into this? Now, I want to go to one specific class of black America, that population within the population, is the formerly educated black bourgeois class, the boule, those who have separated themselves from the masses of blacks by their education, by their abilities, and by their mindset. They are indeed that interlocking linchpin that is to be called to the carpet, that is to be exposed for the positions that they play. 
Now, I understand not all formally educated black professionals feel this way, but there are so many that you are the majority. So you allow your formal education to be a means or in your own mind, a means or a springboard into middle class America because of your learned behavior and your learned behavior uncovers your with your artificial glibness, your connection to your open enemy and how you want to please your open enemy. This is indeed a sickness. So how do we look at blacks here in America today? How do we look at a young man who was shot in his back eight times and literally continue business as usual and par for the course? I find it very serious that one can change a person's mindset by years and years of abuse, years and years of training, and years and years of having that interlocking linchpin, that hypocrite, that boot-licking, cotton-mouth black individual to play their role and uphold with the strength of Hercules, the status quo. Oh, indeed, we are indeed a a serious problem. And we are now losing the thought of our young generation, and I cannot blame them, as we scorch them repeatedly by them being told by our generation that they're the worst generation on the planet, that what it is that they do, they can't understand it. Well, let me be very specific. Go back to those who have taught them the behavior. So, as a child, there were certain codes of conduct that had to be adhered to in my growing up. So when an elder saw you doing things that you knew were outside of what you had been taught to be correct, they would use a term, and I'm sure all of us can tie back to this term, what has gotten into you? What are you thinking about? What are you doing? But it goes back to what has gotten into you. So when we look at black America, we understand, and let's be very clear, when we look at blacks in America and the actions, the attitudes, and the behaviors, what has gotten into them is the script that has been carried out by their open enemies. They have been indeed indoctrinated for self-hate, for self and what we call black-on-black -black crime to be average, for it to manifest for it to fester and multiply exponentially to the point where you can manipulate what it is that the material culture or the want of material culture will cause this group to do. So the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said it. He said, knowledge of one's identity, one's self, one's community, one's nation, one's religion, and one's God is the true meaning of a resurrection, while ignorance of it signifies hell. We are indeed in hell. And we don't have to be underground where it's burning and there's some young person, there's some old person, there's some middle-aged person with a pitchfork and some kind of suit with a tail. We understand who is the real devil. Just look to the actions, the attitudes, and the behaviors of those who have controlled for years the outcomes of what black life will be. Edward Blyding, a very wise man, and on his grave, it says, I hate all mulattoes. Very strong statement. But I want to follow up with something else that he said. Every race has a soul. And the soul of that race finds its expressions in its institutions. And to kill those institutions is to kill the soul. No people can profit or be helped under institutions which are not the outcome of their own character. Very, very serious mandated to look at this again. No people can profit or be helped under the institutions which are not the outcome of their own character. What have we established here in the wilderness of North America as black that has caused us to say that we have our own character on top of something that is very popular and something that is very productive? No, what we have our hands on is the ability to raise a group of people who have been taught to look to other people for food, clothing, shelter, and safety. That is unnatural. That is against 
all of the elements that go on with any other species. Now, the ant, as small as the ant is, the ant is very mighty. The ant goes along doing exactly what the ant is supposed to do because it's at one with God. It's in tune with its reality. How about the spider? We talk about spiders and how the spider can eat other insects. Just having a spider around will get rid of other insects. But if you ever look to the spider's web, you rarely see the spider spinning the web. You only see the web when the spider's done. It is, in it is indeed in tune with reality, in tune with its outcome, and in tune what it's supposed to be doing as far as society. And then we talk about the black man, woman, and child. Diametrically opposed to their original position, diametrically opposed to what it is that they should be doing in life for the betterment of future generations. How can you look to it other than to say, for the oppressor, oppression costs too much if the oppressed stand up and protest. Now, we don't mean that you should go outside with a sign and stop traffic and march. We mean that you should go into your household, have candid conversations with your young children, make yourself far more valuable to your family by being one who will lead righteously. For this is for our young men. Oh, no. I see the warrior in you. You are a rebel, and you will always be looked to as a rebel. Now the question is, how do we get you to understand that you're a rebel with a cause? And with that cause comes sacrifice, and with that cause comes the ultimate uplifting of an entire generation. How can we, as adults today, blame the youth for the way they conduct themselves? when all that we have told them is that they're less than worthy of being in middle-class America, which all of us, for the most part, ascribe to, especially those of us who are professionals. We have to be very cognizant of how we have been able to go to certain schools. And let's talk about education very quickly. Lots of us have associate degrees, AAs. Lots of us have high school diplomas, associate degrees, and BAs, bachelor's degrees. Lots of us have high school diplomas, associates, BAs, and masters of arts, MAs. Lots of us have high school diplomas, associate's degrees, bachelor's of arts, master of arts, and there is a unique and a growing population of us who have PhDs and have become doctors and never speak of all of the turmoil that you've gone through to get those. So you don't make it plain enough for the generation. You make it an illusion. So you have to be far more candid that an AA, a BA, a MA, and a PhD can sometimes equal up to BS if you're not grounded in what's important with future generations. And a PhD only means that BS, that BS is piled higher and deeper. That's all it means when you don't have a connection to those of you who will never get a PhD, an MA, a BA, or an AA. So you separate yourself through the formal education of right superiority. How can we continue on this pace without being erased from this planet? We are well on our way to aiding and assisting our own genocide. Yes, brothers and sisters, I know this is hard conversation, this is hard talk, but we indeed need to talk just like this. And if not, what is the use in me coming before you and going along to get along? I might as well stand on this table and dance with no music or scratch with absolutely no itch if I'm not telling future generations exactly what they will face because we are not doing a good enough job by those who have been ordained, if you will, to do and complete that job. I understand. So hypocrisy, individualism, and self-awareness rarely go hand in hand. That's where you see that professional bourgeois class doing all that they can to hoard middle class rewards, minor middle class rewards, trinkets, things that will this time next year be obsolete. So you got the brand new phone. 
you have the brand new car, but you are an old Negro. So what I mean by that is when you look at things without telling the truth for your own protection or just your cowardice won't allow for you to tell the truth because you know, I think that we should go a little slower. I think that what you're saying is far too radical. It doesn't help anyone. And that's why your children have a hate for you that is being demonstrated upon the very head that they beat you across the head with on a regular basis. That's why they don't listen to you. They no longer want to go to the church because of Deacon Lowdown and Reverend No Good. They've seen this for years and years and they're tired of uh, the way that you go about manipulating and the ideas of how you have traded their future. And without it being said, they feel it. So VP Franklin, uh, an author, he said it very candidly. The book is called Black Self-Determination and I want to quote him here. You have never asked for white advice, yet the masses of whites seem to feel you stand in need of their tutelage as if you lack the insight to understand your own interests. I agree with Dr. Franklin. Our own interests have been twisted. We have got our own interests diametrically opposed to what will be successful for us. How do you explain to a child that they can't have the new Xbox? How do you explain to the child that material culture isn't what they seek when all the entire population has looked to as a means to justify their ability to sell out the masses of black folks comes in something tangible, something you can touch, a phenomenon. How can we continue at this pace as Americans, more specifically black Americans, and considered to be productive citizens? Oh, this is so very important that you understand. Well, this is just not the thought pattern and the paradigms and the quotes of a bald head, wild eyed militant that you see on TV once a week. No, this is the screams that are coming from the graves and the voices from those who are voiceless. Yes, I represent that group. I represent every bit of Edward Blythe. I represent every bit of Marcus Garvey, every bit of Martin Delaney, every bit of David Walker, every bit of these people. All of that is in me, and as you see it, it's emulated, and now what you see it is it gushing out of me. That's because I understand how important this will be in a very short time. Now, America, the way you deal and the way that you have dealt with blacks here in America, for that you will pay. Your dreaded retribution cannot be avoided. Now for you who are professional blacks who want to separate yourself, then you'll tie into your open oppression when that dreaded retribution comes. Yes, you will be charged as such. So to go along to get along for your salary, so that you can continue to have your children in private schools. You can continue to live amongst people who have for years said they don't want you to live amongst them. How do you justify that? I find it very, very unique, and I find it sadistic, that you can justify exactly the things that you have done to uphold this cleavage in our society. It's very important that you understand that your time is ticking for that black bourgeois population. Why is it that you're such in fear of our young people? Why is it that you continue to make them out to be the bad portion of this equation, the ill portion of our society, when you taught them exactly what you wanted to teach them that was important, and now they rejected it? So I say to our young population, Yes, indeed, we are counting on you. And you have to make sure that you understand what you're up against. And you have to find heroes who look just like you. And you have to hold your heroes to a certain level of accountability. So for all of you who look to politicians 
Well, a wise man told me years ago, nine times out of ten, when you see a politician's mouth moving, it's a lie. How do you explain that without saying it quite like that? Well, I wouldn't quite say it like that. Well, then it needs to be said in that manner. You need to stop tiptoeing around the truth. Deal with the truth for some of those theories that you've used to justify what it is that you think is important to keep you separated from the masses of black people. For that, we see the outcomes without question. And one man that makes a lot of sense with one of these quotes is the great Asa Philip Randolph, and he said, true liberation can be required and maintained only when the Negro possesses power. And power is the product and flower of organization of the masses. We still have a problem with unification. And it comes back down to truth. Our unification can't be looked to as something that we can manipulate. It can't be. And until the lion have historians, hunters will be the hero. If you're still an egg today, you're still an ox tomorrow. If you want to know if a dog has teeth, pull his tail. Snake does not bite without cause. And the Holy Quran reads, chapter 4, verse 2, and not mix falsehood up with the truth. We want to make sure that at least a voice is heard that's uncompromisingly accurate and we do understand the time. Yes, we do understand the time and what must be done. We must change from the very bell tower to the very surface on how we think about raising our youth, especially our young ladies. You are indeed the most precious product that we have. I say to everyone who had a chance to sit and listen today that in no means am I speaking as a superior, but as your brother who understands because of my training how important these matters are. Ladies and gentlemen, this information may in no means change your mind, but because truth in you are so very important to me, I just thought you ought to know. I remain with esteem and respect a distinguished man of color, Frederick Douglass Dixon. Now run, tell, laugh.